not at all. There was something much deeper that God had moved in my heart when we were originally with these five students sitting together in a living room and prayed about what God would call this ministry. And it comes from here, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So there you see the very beginnings of where you might be able to get a clue and where we might have come up with one love. Now let's look at this line by line. Join me now, if you would, at verse 1. Let's take this apart and see what it says here. First of all, it says this. Paul is speaking, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. I want to pause you right there. Can you look at me for a second, please? Did you describe yourself today in the last week? Would you as a Christian be able to describe yourself to someone as a prisoner? See, I think this is something that we forget because he says the sun set you free. When he set you free, you're free indeed. And we go, woohoo! And we think that means free to be our own boss. Mm -mm. That's where maybe some of us are struggling right now. Because you went back for thirds and fourths at Thanksgiving. Family, we are not our own boss. You are slaves of the ones in whom you obey, either sin resulting in death or Jesus Christ resulting in righteousness, Romans 6 says. See, I love to tell people, you know, why I don't have affairs and why I don't take money from the coffer and why I don't do all these things. People, well, you're not supposed to. It's not. No, no, no. I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to. My life is not my own. I am a prisoner. My boss is Jesus Christ. And guess what? If you are a prisoner, you go where your prison master takes you. Amen? So your prison master isn't taking you to porn. He's not taking you to these places. He did. And so if you are following the master, then you as a bond servant of Jesus Christ then can go on and say this, as a prisoner of the Lord, I entreat you to do what? Walk in the manner. And what's that next word? Come on, it's raining. Help me out here. Worthy. Worthy. Walk in a manner worthy. You see, you're either walking to trouble or out of trouble. Are we walking the walk with the Lord, and is it worthy? Now, I wonder how many times we have asked that question. Lord, is what I'm doing, is my walk worthy of what it says here in the Scriptures? Interesting, a manner that is worthy of what? The calling. Mm. Did you notice that it says calling of that which you have been called? Do not hear the should and the ought, as I spoke about two weeks ago. This isn't God saying this is a should. This, no, no, no. A calling is an invitation. Jesus is calling. It's will you answer. Will you respond this morning? And that's the message. God is calling. And you say, you know what, Lord? I hear that because you know what? Sin and death, the my way highway, that was crash and burn. I thought I was free. And I looked at those kids at church and I said, those are freaks, man. Those guys got all these rules. I'm free. And yet you found out you were the one face down in a gutter, didn't know where your keys were. How did you get home? How did I get into this? How did I get myself in this kind of trouble in business? Because you thought you were leading your own life. But no, no, no. The Bible tells me there's a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And you recognize that you were the one in bondage, and so you were free to be what? A prisoner in Jesus Christ. Hmm. It doesn't end there. He says this, that I have been able to walk in a manner of the calling. And what does this calling give me? Verse 2, with all humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Now, when we look at that list, we just want to go, uh-huh, check, 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 Right? Not so easy to do. With all humility, gentleness, patience, oh my goodness, showing forbearance to one another in love. Once again, may I have your attention? If you and I try to look at this list and say, okay, God, this is what you say we're supposed to be, so I'm going to try and do this, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be frustrated, defeated, and feel like a failure and quit. Because this is not something you and I can do for God. This is something that we do how? Through God. Amen? 
It becomes a byproduct when we are walking in the Spirit of God. When you and I can become natural and honest with where we struggle with God, as we lay these things out, God does something and these happen to us. I'm going to testify to you this morning. Can I get an amen on that? I'm going to testify. (laughs) All right. You all know me. I'm a very transparent guy. I'll I'll let you straight up. You know that I do not have the spiritual gift of waiting. Mm -mm. I do not. Lines. Me and lines have never gotten along. I can go to Costco, and there can be four people in this line and 20 people in that line, and I get in the four people line, and the 20 people have gone through before I've even gotten moved up once. It's, It's the curse. So we go to the airport. And I've been just going through a whole lot of this stuff that I shared with you two weeks ago and just praying and just pouring my heart out to God. And as I'm laying my heart over to Jesus, I'm just saying, Father, you know, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, God, may it be like you. And as I'm laying these things out, we're in line. As we go through, I say, babe, why don't we come over here? And we get in and all of a sudden she, trying to protect her husband, goes, you know, honey, look, there's two lines merging in this one. This one over here, we were, we should have stayed in that line because that's the one that goes through. And I looked at her and I go, well... Maybe somebody in that line is in a bigger hurry than we are to get their flight because we had actually two and a half hours that we were there to get through. And she just looked at me and I looked at her too because we both kind of went. That was patience. Where did that come from? I just had patience. I wasn't in a rush. I wasn't all my space. My, no, the Lord is just teaching me about my time, my need to control the universe. And the byproduct was peace, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Amen? So I'm just telling you, this stuff works. It works. With all humility, gentleness, and patience, showing, and I want you to see this next word, showing forbearance what? Okay. Forbearance to one another, how? Okay. There's a reason why the church doesn't say one like, one hang out, or one tolerate. Okay? It's scripture says here we are to show forbearance towards one another in love. I'm going to say something several times in the sermon, the first time right now. It is God who changes people. Amen. It is God who changes people. Amen. And God's timing is different than ours. Amen. And so we may sometimes see somebody and just go, are you serious? Look what she is wearing. Look how he is acting. Did you smell them? Oh, my goodness. Because we wouldn't say God because we're Christian. (laughs) While you slander somebody. Family, showing forbearance where? To one another. You see, they'll know we are Christians by our programs. No, they'll know we're Christians by... Our love. And so you see, the scripture is saying here that we show forbearance. If we, need, if we can't learn to love one another in this very room, how are we going to do it outside? And so when somebody comes up to me and they say, hey, Waxer, hey, have you heard about so-and-so and they're doing this and they're doing that? And you know, hey, that couple, you know, I hear that they're living together, so on and so forth. I come right up to them right away and say, first of all, are they born again? Are they Christians? Have we baptized them? Are they a part of one love? Did they submit to this family and fellowship? You know, and then if the answer is yes, then I say, secondly, then why are you talking to me? You should be talking to them. That's what the scriptures say. Take your Bible, sit down and say, hey, it's been coming to my attention. That I don't know. Is this true? Because if so, how do you reconcile that with what God's word says here? Because I'm concerned for you. Because the thief is out to kill, steal, and destroy, and compromise kills, and I love you. And you sit down and share. But if the answer is no, then my point is, hallelujah, thank God they're in church, because the only way they're going to get the truth is right here in God's house. So we show forbearance to one another. We let God change each one of us. Every single one of us is a sheep in progress. Amen? And so God is chipping away and cutting off that fat and the wool and everything that Tom we talked about last week in each of our lives. Now we go to verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I want you to circle that word diligent. I want you to meditate on whether that has been your heart. To be diligent to preserve what? The unity of the Spirit. The main thing is to keep what? The main thing what? The main thing. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why we're called to be here. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And so are you diligent to preserve? Meaning this is something that you aggressively go after that we want to preserve the main thing and the focus of why we gather together. Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and God is love. Therefore, there is one. Uh, you should have gotten that a little better. <laughs> Therefore, one, one love. You see, that is where we come up with our name. There is one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And that's what it is. Now, as we see all these different parts of this verse here, as it says that, are we prisoners? Have we fully surrendered? Or am I still asking God to follow my ways? You see, is your prayer life giving God instructions or is it checking in for duty? Are you coming in saying, here I am, Lord, thank you for your grace. And the only thing I ask this morning is that I would know your presence. I want to know your presence. Every step of every moment, God, I want to bask in you. And thankfulness is the language of heaven. Thanking him for all that he's doing in your heart. Is that where you begin your day? He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I want to walk in a manner with all humility and gentleness, having forbearance for one another, doing these things. Why? I want to keep the unity of the spirit of God because there is only one faith, one hope, one Lord, one baptism. All these different elements come together. Each of these elements, as we look at them this morning, are supposed to be able just to come together so that it's such a delicious taste to any who would come to his banquet eating table because his banquet Manner is love. And so that's what he's calling us to do. So what then is our philosophy of ministry? Well, as you see here, there's a post here, there's a post here, and there's one right there and one right there. These key posts, as you see, are holding up this glue lamp that are holding up those beams that are going across that are holding this whole thing together. Basically, I want you to see the four posts that God has called me as a shepherd to be as these are the philosophy of ministry verses of the church. So join me now at chapter 4 of Ephesians at verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11, if you would be there, please. Let me share this with you. It says this in the scriptures. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and some as teachers. So he gives these gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then what's it say for the what? The, for the equipping of what? Saints. The who? Saints. And who would be the saints? Ah, oh, Okay. So it's not those people in St. Louis, okay? It's not just saints in St. Louis, huh? Okay, it's not those people that are in New Orleans, huh? No, no. That was for a, for a few football people out there. Okay, who are the saints? Okay, so what does it just say? I mean, verse 11 says he's called some as pastors, teachers, evangelists. Okay, so that's the giftings that God has given to me. So I got the pastor, teacher, evangelist. That's the gifting that he's given to me. And then what's he say I'm supposed to do? Okay, and an evangelist. And what is he supposed to do for the what? What's that E word? The equipping. For the equipping of the saints for the, what's it say? The work of. You know, it's so funny how quiet both services got right there. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Do you see it there, church? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So the Bible says that the job of pastors is not to go and be at everything, but to raise up the people of God, because out of the plethora of people, the many hands makes... And so my job on a Sunday morning is to come alongside and to equip the who... Saints. The saints to do what? Service. The work of service to God's people, to build up the kingdom. See, why is it then that churches have always thought, well, we need to have evangelism, so let's hire an evangelist pastor. We need to have worship, we need to hire a worship pastor. Well, we need to have this, and so let's get a pastor for the streets, a pastor for this, a pastor for the outreaches. Why, where does it say that in the Bible? Why is it that the people seem to think that it is the pastor who is supposed to be at every hospital call, at every single meeting, at every single prayer meeting, at every single Bible study, at every, when according to the word of God that he has called and equipped me to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, which is why your Sunday morning sermon is not 15 minutes, why it's not just on John 3:16 and how to get saved, because I know how busy you are. I know most of you have one hour, or excuse me, one day where you can set aside time to come, and so I'm going to give you a message, and listen, I know you've watched a sitcom for longer than an hour. You can listen to Jesus for longer than an hour. Amen. And so we come in here and we try to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I'll talk more about that later. Now let's go to the second post. Find me at Colossians. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go to the right. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Here's the second post that I see as our philosophy of ministry of One Love Ministries. Colossians 1, verse 9. It says this, for this reason. Mm, I love it. For this reason, since the day we heard of it, we have not, what does it say there, church? Cease to pray. Remember, I've taught you, pray or be pray. For this reason, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Hmm. People, are, what's God's will? Pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so that, why do we not stop praying? Why are we asking for God's wisdom and discernment? So that you may walk, oh, here's that word again, in a manner worthy of the Lord. Hmm. To please him, to please him. Not to please the deacon, not the pastor, not the church, not your grandma. To please him in all respect, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing. Notice, increasing in the knowledge of God. Cracks me up when somebody says they've read the Bible. I read the Bible. When someone tells me they've read the Bible, I said, yeah, you know what? Yesterday I breathed. The Bible is living and active and sharper. You need, it's constant. You can read the same verse and God will show you more and more every single day. Amen? It's like, it's not a book of just information. And so he says here, increasing, I love it, in the knowledge. Verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I'm not getting stronger in me. According to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness. There's that forbearance word again. And patience. Oh, there it is again. Joyously giving thanks to the father who has qualified us. Mm, circle, note, highlight that. Who the father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There's that word saints again. Here's this word qualified. You've heard preachers say this before. God doesn't call the qualified. He what? He qualifies the called. And here's the scripture saying it. But what is he talking about? He's talking about walking in the inheritance. See, God has an inheritance for you here and now. It's not talking about when you get to glory. No, no, no. Right here and now. We're going to learn why he has these for us. These four post pillars are that we would walk in the inheritance that God has got for us. And it's an amazing gift that is so often ignored. So what is this further inheritance? Join me in chapter 3 of Colossians. This is still the second post. Colossians 3, and find me at verse 14. Colossians 3, verse 14. And beyond all these things, it says, put on what? It says, put on love. I want you to take your pencil and just write the word choice right over that, put on love. It's a choice. This morning, you and I chose how I'm going to respond, where I'm going to go. Can I put on love? Because the word of God is telling me right now, Waxer, it is your choice. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the note, the peace of Christ, rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called to one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ, I got the peace of Christ, now the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Hmm. That's right in there. Wisdom, teaching, and admonishing. I'll talk more about that later. One another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's not sing time with Larry when we get here in the beginning, folks. It's not just how can we make jolly. No, the reason why Pastor Matt is ushering us before the throne of God is because it's a key element to the philosophy of ministry of this church. Why? Because God says something happens in you when you do. You find an element of the inheritance that he has promised for you. The peace of Christ, the word of Christ, richly dwell within you. And then verse 17, then whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And drop to verse 23, as you know, one of my favorite verses. And thus, whatever you do, do your work how? Heartily as what? For the Lord rather than for men. Can I just tell you right now in love, I'm just going to be very honest with you. Serving people can be very difficult. Serving people can at times even stink. 
Okay, because they will not show up when they say they will. They'll grumble about this. They'll turn all this thing. All kinds of stuff will happen to serving people. So if you're out serving people, you're probably one of those who's sitting here this morning who once did a ministry at this church or another church and did something, and you just got burned or burned on. You said, fooey, forget that. I'm just going to come and sit in the pew and live my own little quiet life. Problem, my beloved, is because you were serving people. Serve Jesus. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as unto the Lord. And there is something about his inheritance that gives you a freshening inside that you recognize what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you're thus not refueled by their response. You're blessed by his. And that's the miracle that he does. And that's why we have the second pillar. Our first pillar, as we recognize, is that there is a calling and a partnership. The teaching and equipping the saints doing the work of ministry. Then we recognize how we are not to stop praying that God would give us wisdom and discernment and Christ-likeness and that we would serve him. Now let's go to our third pillar, this one right here. Find me at 1 Peter 3. All right. It says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of, what does it say? Righteousness, you are blessed. Stop right there. Did, did, did we read that right? Did he just say the word suffer and blessed in the same sentence? Man, this Jesus guy is messed up. Oh, his ways are not our ways. Amen? Amen? And that he can do far exceeding above what we can ask or imagine. That we look on the outside, he looks on the inside. What does Jesus say through Peter here? He says this. He goes, listen, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Notice, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Translation, do not fear their lawsuits and get all stressed about it because it's my job, not yours. Amen. So. The brought up made hassles. He's attacked the schools. I mean, the churches they're meeting in the schools, all the other different things going on. Okay, great. We're here. I can't imagine. I'm just so excited what God's going to do next. He's got us here for a reason because God is large and it's not my drama. So he tells me not to be troubled, so what am I supposed to do? Verse 15, but, wax, this is what you're supposed to do, Holmes. You need to sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Sanctify Christ as Lord. What does sanctify mean? Help me out. Set apart. Set apart. So, question, Lord. Okay, it's a title. Set apart Jesus as Lord. Who be the Lord? Well, the answer to that question is whoever called the shots yesterday. So, who called the shots? That's the answer to who's the Lord. So, Sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts. That's the very first thing. Lord, can I say today that my life is set apart because you are the Lord? That's the first part that he gives us. Then notice the next thing. Then there's this response. If I first do what I'm asked to do that, then he says this, always being ready to make a defense. That's the apologia word. That's where you get the word apologetics means a response, a reply. Always be ready to make a defense, a response to everyone who asks you, and what are they going to ask you? To give an account for the, what's that word say? The hope that is in you. Now, family, look at me for a second here. Where are they going to find that? See, right here. Right here. Don't be surprised at times that Jesus will set your hair on fire. Why? Because that's when the Egyptians are watching. Anybody can say, I just want to thank the Lord for this Oscar. It was great. Hallelujah. You see these guys and these rappers and their entire album is all about potty mouth, potty mouth. And I just want to thank God. Brother God had nothing to do with your album. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. You don't change. You're going to fry. That's all I'm going to say. Anyone can say, yay, God. But he says here, when you suffer for doing the right thing and there's still something in you, hope. And how will they say, what's going on right here? Are your eyes filled with fear or eyes filled with hope? Why? Because as any smart person in here knows, the moon does not shed any light on its own. The moon is a what? It's a reflection. Are you a full mooner? Or are you a new mooner? How about a crescent? 
Are people able to see something within us? Amen? Now notice what he says. He goes on to say, verse 16. He says, well, let me finish the last part here, with gentleness and reverence. Gentleness and reverence. I know some of you are going to get upset with me, but I'm still going to continue hanging out with those folks that are senators and the reps down there, and even the governor and everybody else. I'm going to still, yeah, they voted other than how I wanted to, but you know what what matters most to me? It's not how they voted. What matters most to me is will they ever surrender their life to Jesus Christ? And you see, these brothers need to know that, hey, we're going to agree to disagree, but I'm not going to go, uh-uh, talk to the bomb, you're not the bomb. No way. <laughs> these guys need to know what matters, and that is their soul. And I've already had lunch with a couple of them, and just make manal, make house it with them, because that's what God has called us to do. And you know, Christians, I just got to say, I find it rather ironic that we have the body of Christ get so upset about the same-sex marriage thing. And believe me, it's not God's word will away, but I sure wish the body of Christ would find themselves equally upset about all the heterosexual people who are living together. And all the sex that's going on, period, that is not sanctified by God Almighty. Oh, we don't see that one. Mm -mm. And I just got to say, don't even get me started, I don't got enough time. But God doesn't find any less delight in one or the other. And if you are here and you are a child of God and you are physically active with someone who is not your wife, it does not honor God. It grieves him. And yet we all, we pick the ones that we want to get all upset about. Come on. Family, righteousness is righteousness. What you're doing on your taxes is no different than what these folks wanted to do down at the Capitol. You're either obeying God's word, will or way, or not. Amen? And that's what God is calling us to do, to live lives that are righteous and holy. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Go back to that thing about I am a prisoner. He is my Lord. Always being ready to give a defense, a response, to ask you how with gentleness and reverence. Now let's go to that fourth post, please. And join me now at 1 Thessalonians 3. 1 Thessalonians 3. Find me at verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12 says this. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in numbers. Is that what it says? Ah. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love. What does it say? For one another. Hmm. You think there might be a reason why we came up with this clever name? May you increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, regardless of their gender, regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their whatever this, we are to have a love for all men. That is what the Bible says. And that word men is anthropos, meaning all humanity. God so loved the including the lost and those who are struggling and those who are lost in all kinds of darkness. God has called you and I to love because who changes lives? God. Are you still with me here? Amen? Okay, so this is the philosophy of ministry here. The philosophy of ministry in this church is anybody, you come, you hear the word of God, and when you give your life to Jesus, then you're going to surrender your life and saying, hey, I want to be discipled. I want to grow in what it means to be a mature Christian and what that looks like. That's the purpose. That's the philosophy that we see here, that we are to grow in love. What's it say? Verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts. Who does it? I don't do it. The church doesn't. Jesus, so that he will establish your hearts unblameable. There's that word blameless I spoke about two weeks ago. In holiness before our our God and our Father, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his, there's them saints again. Wow. I told you that we can go out these doors today blameless. Hallelujah. Because we can bring our hearts and say, Father, I've just been so judgmental this family weekend, and I was criticizing this, and God, forgive me. I was criticizing where I felt the church was failing, where this person dropped the ball, whatever it is, God. And we can bring this and just lay it at his, and he, boom, let him forgive you. And we go out the door blameless because we were able to walk in the power of his transforming word. Amen? Amen. Very important. So here we see that he gave us to do the equipping work. He gave us to walk in a manner worthy. He lets the word of Christ dwell within us, that we are to sanctify Christ as Lord of our hearts, and then we're to increase in the bound of love. These are the things that we see that are distinct for us. You see, this philosophy of ministry, these four verses, are what affect my view of the church. Now let me explain that to you. My view of the church. My understanding of the church, well, it comes all the way back to something that one of my college professors taught me years ago, Dr. Fisher, a godly man, and he said this, 
Always be weary, son, of anyone who introduces himself as reverend. He says, reverend is what a man should be called, not what he calls himself. It's a great insight. And I've watched that. And that's one of the reasons why you will recognize me to introduce myself as saying waxer. And one of the things I love about Pastor Waxer is it's hard to say Pastor Waxer with a straight face. <laughs> Just kind of gets all that pantanon spirit out of there. Now, many of you, because of God's ministering through, you'll say, hey, Pastor, that's great and that's fine. What you call me is what the Lord lays upon your heart. But there is a sense of what we've seen already in the scriptures three times about humility, that we are just one servant serving another. Well, that's one of the first things that he said is beware of a man who will call himself reverend. And then I also have that same view when it comes to revival. I cannot say that on Thursday night at six o'clock, we're going to have a revival meeting. No, revival is what happens when God's people walk in these four pillars. It's a byproduct when we humble ourselves and listen to God's word. And it's equally true when I say the word church. We're not a church because we have a bulletin. We're a church because we have Jesus Christ. And when Jesus starts doing something in our lives and we start looking different, acting different, being different, not just go to church, but be the church, that makes us a church. Other than that, we are a gathering of people. And you see, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. So then I ask you, what then are the basic principles based on our philosophy of ministry, these four posts, what are the basic principles that I have tried to teach? Well, let me just give you them in simplicity. Number one, keep it simple. Keep it simple. This ministry has always had the KISS method. Keep it simple, saint. <laughs> Recognize that there's not a whole lot of fluff there's not a whole lot of different things and distractions and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because the main thing is to keep the main thing, main. the main thing. So we keep it simple. Listen, if this thing was started on creativity, then the next week it would have to be bigger and better. And the next week, and pretty soon I got the dancing bears and the flaming torches and everything else. You know what I'm saying? It's like we got to one-up ourselves every single holiday and everything. No, 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 no. We just simply teach the word simply because God's word says it doesn't return void. So we keep it simple. Sundays are about Jesus and his word. Now, what about evangelism, discipleship, and missions? Family, those will follow. Those will follow. When you teach the word and equip the saints for the work of the ministry, the ministry becomes not a program that you sign up for. It becomes the birthing in your heart that all of a sudden you feel a desire for dot, dot, dot. That's the kind of ministry that some of you might be, man, I've been coming here for so long and I'm just waiting for someone to tell me. I ain't going to tell you. I'm waiting for him to tell you. Amen. But the question is, is have you been asking him? Have you been seeking the Lord? Lord, where are my giftings? What, what, what are my callings? And so we have to recognize that we are first and foremost a church that keeps it simple. And then secondly, we emphasize service. We emphasize service. Why do I emphasize service? Because I need free labor? No. I emphasize service for one reason. The example that was given to me. The example given to me. Look overhead. Mark 10 says this. And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your what? And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be? Okay, slave of all. How's that? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, help me out, serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's my master. My boss, who I am a prisoner unto, did not come to be served. You are never going to find three golden chairs with the highest one in the middle up there. And we do this little dun -dun 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 and come in and sit down. Ain't going to happen. There ain't no hierarchy here. I am just simply one beggar telling other beggars where I found food. Why? Because God gave me a gift of teaching and discernment. He gave me that ability to equip saints, and so that's what I must do. I will tweak and pop if I don't. <laughs> this is who I am called to be, and to you, who are you called to be, and are you walking in the inheritance of the fruit of the blessing of walking in it? And so that's what he calls us to do is to serve. How do we serve? Well, understand first and foremost, and hear me now on this. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Amen. 
It is not a spectator sport. And we just get into that. Hey, I come because that guy who fires me up, or I love the worship team, and this and that. And then you just kind of go right back out and put that Bible in that car seat, and then it's right there for next Sunday when you need it. And just ready to roll. Christianity is not a spectator sport. The Lord tells me that I am to serve, and I'm going to tell you clearly at least two ways that I am called to serve. No, I'm going to give you three. Number one, I'm called to serve each other. One another in this very room, the family of God. If we can't learn to love on one another right here now, how are we going to do it out there? And so that's why we send out these emails and say, hey, there's a single mom here and she needs moving. Hey, this person's car broke down. We need somebody can help it. Hey, there's an opportunity. Hey, someone is leaving the island. They got a washer they want to give to. You know, anyone out here need it? And you see, we want to be able to minister and care for one another. A family that serves one another. That's what we're called to do. But then secondly, we are to serve one love as a ministry. If this is your church, if this is where God has called you to be, the Bible says in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us every single one of you has spiritual gifts. Amen? Amen. Every single one of you have a spiritual gift. Now, believe it or not, God has gifted all of us, and our joy comes when we use that gift. My, one of my favorite movies of all time, Chariots of Fire. Because I identify so much with Eric Little. Not because I'm fast when I run, far from it. But he told his sister, she said, why are you doing this? You got China, you know, we got the missions. And he says, listen, Becky, God made me fast. And he said, and when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And as a young man, at this time I was like 15 years old, but I had already been teaching in small groups and things like that in my youth group. And right then and there, I just said, oh, yes, Lord, that's what it's like when I teach God's word, when the penny drops and the light goes on and someone gets it, mm, I feel your pleasure. And you see, that's what it's about when you walk in your gifts and your giftings. God has given everything. Do you know your gifting? If you don't, we've got spiritual gifts tests. You can grab them on the way out. They're right there in the front. And go right through, boom, and begin to discover who you are and how God made you. What part of this puzzle that God has put us in? But we all know that the joy comes when we are operating in our gifts, including even our giving. Because even when we are in tithing, we're saying, God, I thank you that you are the one that gives me. Because tithing is not how much of my money I give to God. Mm-mm. It's how much of God's money I keep. It's recognizing this whole thing. So now think about it with me. You got a toolbox. Purpose of a toolbox is for a carpenter to build something. And if he opens up his toolbox and all he has is flathead screwdrivers, there's not much he can get done. He can change every light plate in your house, but that's about it. A carpenter needs what in his toolbox? Okay, a whole variety of tools, does he not? Okay, so why does the church seem to keep thinking we're all supposed to look alike? There is a reason why you look different, why you act different, you have a different background, you have a different gifting, you would do things differently, duh. But I can't do everybody's differently all at the same time, duh. So God has given you that gift, and so a carpenter, our Heavenly Father, wants to be able to open up a toolbox and have a plethora of different tools so that he can build the masterpiece that he wants to build here on earth for the people to see his name. Amen? Amen. Okay, are you with me on that? Okay, you sure? All right, because I'm going to call you out on something. Why then do the people in the body of Christ embrace that and say, yes, you know, with spiritual gifts, and I know I have my gift, and you've got your gift, and all these other different things, and and God brought us here to be different parts of the piece of the puzzle so that we can do the kingdom of God. Why is it that for some reason in Christendom, people seem to think that the pastor is supposed to look like this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's supposed to be able to have this gifting, and then, of course, you need to be able to file things, and, of course, you need things to be level. Folks, there's nothing level about me. Come on. You know, in a a level, and you need to be able to cut here, and, of course, you need to have that tape measure. Family, I'm going to tell you right now, this is a freak. Okay? I could not use this to get anything done. And so, wives, if you're out there right now and you see that tool that does everything, don't buy it. It's junk. Okay? It won't. It's not. I mean, this here is not functioning. This is a freak. And yet, for some reason, we freak out because, oh, how come the pastor isn't doing this? 
Oh, the pastors aren't there. I tried to do this. They didn't respond this way. This didn't happen in these people. All these are different things. Folks, if we just recognize that we've got the body of Christ, then understand that some of you have the giftings of mercy. Please be merciful. Some of you have the gift of giving. Please help give and support those who are trying to go out on the short-term missions, whatever it is that God's calling them to do. We need to be a part of the body and not expect, especially our pastor, to look like this. Because if anyone does know me, what gift mix am I really in here? If I was one of these tools, what am I? That would be the hammer. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Okay. Just doing my job. All right. Now, we have to understand that. Give grace even to the man who's up here with you. Because I cannot be all things to all people in all ways. And so, let my gift mix be my gift mix. And when it's not, just say, that's not his gift mix. Rather than get all haboot, get all beat up and say, oh, I got to leave the church and all this kinds of stuff where the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. Amen. So now we understand that we are called to serve each other. We're called to serve a church that God calls us to be a part of. But do you recognize that that is so essential that it was actually the core value in the beginning of the foundation of this church? What? Yeah, believe it or not, in the first year and a half of this church, I think even the first two years of this church, we had a principle called the three free principle. Every single Sunday when we gave the announcements, we said, hey, welcome, da 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 da, da. And by the way, uh, we're glad you're visiting with us, but if, this, if you've come more than three times, we want to let you know we have the three free principle, which means your first three Sundays, you're more than welcome just to come and sit and enjoy. But if you've come on the fourth, then that means God's calling you to this place. We want to know how can you get involved. And so we had this card right there inside in the bulletin. And it was right there, the three free principles, okay? So they flip it to the next side, and this is what it had right there in the back. So how can we plug you in? Where are you? You want to be a part of the administration? You want to be a part of the apologetics ministries? You want to be a part of the audio, the CD, wherever it is? How can we plug you in? Because of God's people all have God's gift, and how do we plug in? You know what we got known as? We got known as the church that was hard to go to. Literally, I had people say, one love, oh yeah, that's that church that's really hard to go to. They're like, make you do something. <laughs> Family, there isn't a church on the planet that doesn't have this because that's what God's called us all to do. Yeah. I was just dumb enough to put a card in your bulletin. <laughs> I don't know, maybe because I read it in the Bible. <laughs> and figured out, wow. How can I, as your equipper, help you discover your gifts, use them, walk in the inheritance, let's see people's lives get changed, and the life and the kingdom of God and his love flow throughout the islands? What a crazy thought. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Then there's the third part that we serve, each other, a church, and then the church as a whole. People have asked me, why do we do things down at Kauai Ha'o? Why don't we do something in our church? Why do we go do this on Halloween over at their church? Why? Because there is one faith, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one love. And hey, if I hear that the Nazarenes down there need something and so forth, and we've got it, we've got extra pain from something that we were doing here, and they're going to, boom, I want to give it. I want to be able to be a part of it, because I do not want to be a man who looks at labels. I want to be one who looks at my Lord. And he is worshipped in many different contexts, and they all know we are Christians by our doctrine, by our programs, no, by our love. Our love. All right. Now, we've got to keep it simple. We need to emphasize service, and the third basic principle is this, stay true to the calling. Stay true to the calling. And what is the calling? Well, you'll find it also in your bulletin somewhere. And that is simply this. Win, build, and send. Like I said, I like to keep things simple. Win. Lost people matter to God, thus they should matter to us. Amen? So people need the Lord. So there are two fronts that you and I need to be about the winning of lost people to Jesus Christ. And that's individually and corporately. Individually, let me ask you, and I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got saved because someone shared, you, shared Jesus Christ with you or invited you to church. Raise your hand. Hold it up nice and high. Okay, awesome. All I want to ask you is, have you returned the favor? See, have you done what someone had done for you, and that is invested themselves in you? Because we are to win, but it is not the job of the church. It's for the pastor to equip the saints to do the work of the service. And what is the service? It's win, build, and send. And so have you shared with somebody? I want you just to say at work, to say to your uncle that you saw this weekend at the family reunion, whatever it is, and say, hey, I know you know I'm a Christian, but can I take you to lunch and tell you why? 
Because you see, everybody has their preconceived ideas of what we are. Oh, gay haters or this or that and all this other nonsense that's just so not true. And just simply say, hey, I know that you know I'm a Christian, but do you know why? Could I share with you what Jesus Christ has done in my life? Because, man, I too, I struggled with what church was and people. And, but let me tell you what God did. And you begin to share. You see, that's how we begin to bring hearts to Christ. Do you have in your Bible, do you have in your devotional a card in it that has three names of people who you want to see step from hell to heaven? That you just pray for every morning? Last time I read, it says you have not because you... Hmm. Have you asked God just to burden you? I would say maybe find that piece of paper in your bulletin, and if God's given you a name right now of Uncle Fred, write it down. Who is it that's on your heart that you pray and you say, Lord, give me the right time to share with them? You see, high-impact churches will reach souls. You see, we need to pray for them, we need to invite them, and then we need to share with them what God has done for us. God bless you. But individually we share, but then also corporately. Yes, as a church, it is my heart that we as a church will set up context. And so that's why we do the certain outreaches that we do, the certain events that we do that you would bring friends and family to. People say to me, why do we spend so much time doing the picnics? Why do we go down to Memorial Day and Fourth of July? I just sometimes shake my head. The reason for Fourth of July, folks, is so that we can build shoulders one alongside one another. That's why we do Memorial Day. That's why we do the surf contest. That's why we do things to bring people to non-churchy things so they can find out we're humans saved by grace. Amen? But it doesn't end there. The second thing is to build. What does build mean? It means to disciple. I don't have the time this morning, but you know I've said many times that it's probably the most ignored verse in the Bible. Go and make disciples. Not hang out with, not find, not delight, not dance with. Go and make disciples. <laughs> And I know most of you found yourself at some time we weren't discipled, and so you have a hard time discipling someone because you weren't. That's why we have the classes here. You know, there's opportunities where this church is seeking to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Why? Because God wants us to win. Why? Because lost people matter to God. Number two, build. Why? Because my master commands that I go and make disciples, that I mature people in Christ. Why? Because as they mature, the byproduct is service. And as they serve, then they find joy and delight because, as Eric Little said, they feel themselves in the pleasure of how they were designed to be. Oh, it's so awesome. And then the third thing that we are to do is send. Remember, we need to be a kingdom seeker, not an empire builder. We're about building up the kingdom of God. And so there are times when we send, like even on this very stage last week where we send Brother John out. Man, I got a lot going on right now. It's not a good time to lose someone who had been so helpful. However, when God guides, God provides. When God calls, he must answer. And so my brother goes. And so staff is going to come. Staff is going to go. Why? Because John the Baptist, his job was to point people to Jesus. And they left his ministry and followed the Lord. That's what we need to do. And so guys are going to come, guys are going to leave, men and women, all of, all of part of it. Just, dear sister this morning, I'm not going to embarrass her, she just came up and told me that today is her last day. Grieves my heart. But I'm stoked and delighted that we're sending out more missionaries as we do what God has called us to do. Listen, we've got short-term, long-term missions, whatever it is. The whole, the whole part is that my, my master, my boss said, go. Remember that, Matthew? Go. Go into all the world? Go. Have you gone anywhere? See, if I was to summarize it very simply, it's this. A healthy church ought to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's a healthy church. That's my plan in every sermon is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And so we are here because God's word wants to continue to shape and mold us into righteousness. Amen? Amen. All right, so let me summarize this real simple. These same core values, they have been here since 2005. They haven't changed. There's only seven of them. Why don't I pick seven? Because seven is always a good number to pick when you're doing God stuff. All right, cool. Number one, lost people matter to God. So they should matter to us. Amen? So stop right there. Look at me. There's an old story that goes this way. The question is, who in heaven cares about the lost? The answer is everybody. The second question is, who in hell 
cares about the lost. Well, according to the scriptures, when we know when Lazarus found himself in hell, he cared very much about the lost. He said, please send somebody to tell my brothers and cousins and warn them. And so who in heaven cares? Everybody. Who in hell cares? Everybody. So then the real question is, who on earth cares? Who on earth cares about the lost? Because lost people matter to God. Do they matter to you and I? And does our actions, our philosophy of ministry, our resources, do they reflect that? Number two, core value. Worship and Bible study comprise a lifestyle expressed how? Private consistency and corporate vibrancy. Very simple. If you are a child of God, your worship and your time in the Word will bring about a lifestyle that is obviously, it's private consistency. You are the same person here as you are at home. You are not Deacon Jones at church and a jerk at home yelling, losing your temper, going off on things, not saying that I'm not willing to seek any help, I'm perfect and I don't need to talk. No, 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 no. Every single one of us needs sometime someone to speak into our lives and us to humble ourselves. Because I told you before, you're only as sick as your secret. You're as sick as your secret. Pastors go to one another. People go to one another. We need to go to one another. And so it's private consistency and then corporate vibrancy. We come together and we worship God and we celebrate God. And like I said, you stand if you want. You sit if you want. You put your hands up if you want. You just celebrate Jesus. Amen? Amen. Then we've got the next one here. Verse, uh, core value three. The good news is that he accepts us as we are. The great news is, is that he doesn't leave us that way. Folks, this pastor of this church will always let people come in this door as we are because Jesus has come just as you are. And the good news is that he doesn't let us stay that way. And so, as I said before, some of you might have been hurt and wounded by others and some, now is the time to say, Father, it's time to get real. It's time to get right. I need to walk in that inheritance again and that fruit that's there. And I want to recognize that acceptance is the key. Acceptance is the key. Why? Because I taught you already. Change is whose job? It's God's job. And so let's give one another. Let's have forbearance and love towards one another. I am a work in process. If you want a better pastor, then start praying for the one you got. And God will continue to work in my life as we work together with one another. Core value number four. The church should be culturally relevant while remaining doctrinally and personally pure. Absolutely true. This church is going to remain culturally relevant now remaining doctrinally and personally pure. Number five. Core value five. What we've learned this morning is that life change happens best in small groups. As I said to you last week, is there somebody that says, how you doing? Hey, I haven't seen you in a while, but I kind of like it that way. Well, then that's why you're just never going to grow. Life change happens best in small group because belonging encourages authenticity. What does it say in James 5, 16? It says, confess your sins to one another and then you will be healed. Two weeks ago message, if you missed it, listen to it online. We are to come to one another, and that is where you will grow in your healing, in your marriage, in your strength, in your walk with God. And if you are not, this is not a small group. No, no, no. Find yourself in something in the women's ministry, men's ministry, couples ministry, or start one. But get together with people who can grow and laugh and cry with you and know what's going on in your heart. Core value number six, who you are is more important than what you know or what you do. This is about integrity. We want to be people of integrity. And then core value number seven, a call to servanthood and ministry is the natural progression of a maturing believer. That's what I see. If you look at those verses that I gave you this morning on our four post, a call to servanthood and ministry using your gifts and talents is the natural progression of a maturing believer. And so if you are a spectator, then right there you have a reflection of how mature your Christian life is. Because as one grows in Christ, they are not asking for the church to give them something. They're saying, Lord Jesus, how can I be involved and give back to that which you have been pouring into my life? That's what the Bible says. So where do we go from here? We've heard this philosophy of ministry. We've heard these simple core values of this church. But I will tell you this, that I do believe that every single one of you, there is a place for you, there is a need for you, there is a call for you to serve Jesus Christ. And I would love for it to be a part of this ministry. Because I had a dream in a car in New Jersey to start this church. Yeah, I know, I told God he needed a GPS. 
I drove all the way to the East Coast because I thought I was going to go to England and be a Bible professor. And he said, no, I want you to go back to Wahoo and plant a church. I said, really? You waited till I got all the way out here? <laughs> He's like, yeah, Cindy likes to drive. <laughs> she does. So I slept through the other 18 states as she drove back. <laughs> and here we are. So what does this thing look like? Go ahead and open that next slide. What does our blueprint really look like? Go on. Recognize here, we've got pastors, we've got elders, we've got facilities, ministries, programs. These are all parts. Let's take a look at these. What is the facilities? Well, just recognize this very place. They're in the back in this very room. We know it's leaking this morning here with the rain. There needs to be folks who bring and care and serve one another. You say, hey, my gift isn't teaching or preaching. Great, but maybe you have handyman skills. How can we get involved to create the context so that things can happen? We're going to have to decorate in here because we want to celebrate Jesus. You're a decorating kind of person. You've said, man, this building is plain. Yeah, it is. But one day at a time, one thing at a time, well, let the main thing be the main thing. But then, yeah, let's begin to decorate this thing so people come in and just get blessed by God. Amen? So, hey, facilities. Then we've got other things. So check it out. We've got ministries. And this is the core that enables us as a church to get the word out. So that's what the ministries are about. How can we take what God is doing with us on Sunday mornings and get it out? In areas of like worship and the elders and prayer and hospitality, men's and women's and youth. And there are so many others than what you see right here. And then there's also, as it goes on, you recognize there are the programs. The programs, again, come from the other, which now we see these are the supplemental programs that allow us to reach the mission field that he called us to win, build, and send. And so we've got missions and we've got needs for rides, needs to care for our kupuna, drug and alcohol ministry. As I said before in the first service, some of you have gone through this incredible painful season in your life. Family, I'm asking if you've gone through that to please connect with me, call the office because we need to have a strong ministry that can minister to people, especially as God calls us into this area of downtown. And so I want to be able to have people who can say, yes, brother, yes, sister, been there, and walk with one another and be able to be even those uh, uh, supporters for them and tell them who the name of that higher power is, and it's Jesus Christ. And so shepherding schools, I said, so many other things. What's going to really make this thing happen here in Kakako when we get this? I've shown this diagram to you before. Let me show it to you again. So often a ministry is all about a love for God or a love for the world or a love for the church. But what as I understand, what makes a healthy ministry is when we're smack dab in the middle and we have all three. You don't need the knowledge. Let God use you and bless you by his will and his strength. Amen. That's it. That's it. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.